All right, y'all. Welcome back for another episode of Let's Talk About It. Student counseling with friends. Today, our friend is Jasmine. She is a graduate student uh, and the president of GSG, and I'll let her explain that more in depth here in a few minutes. But this is Herb. I'm the host, and I am a counselor in Student Counseling Services. Like I say all the time, counseling is still going. We're meeting virtually, uh, Zoom sessions and phone sessions. And so if you would like to set up a session, you can do that. You can do the online uh, version going through the patient portal. You can call and set, a, uh, set an appointment up. Or if you were already connected with counseling, you can reach out with your therapist and reach out to your therapist via the patient portal and set up an appointment. And so, you know, this is, we're in crazy times, you know, we're adjusting to it and it can still be difficult. And so just know that support is here via student counseling services. And we're, you know, of course, we're doing this podcast and we have a lot of content that we're pushing out on a day-to-day -day basis. So follow us on IG at UABSCS for student counseling services and keep up with what we have going on. So now to the fun part, we have a good buddy of mine on campus and Jasmine, introduce yourself to the crowd, to the people. Yeah, my name is Jasmine Benjamin. I am in that gray area between my third and fourth year of the Graduate Biomedical Sciences PhD program here at UAB. Uh, my research looks at the cellular signaling mechanisms that link the glucagon and insulin receptors. So in a word, diabetes, um, we're kind of looking to make use of what we previously thought was insulin and glucagon working against each other, but what may actually be insulin and glucagon working together um, in an effort to treat uh, type 2 diabetes. I, like you said, Herb, I am, you know, the president-elect of the graduate student government, so I take office June 1st, and i um, really excited about that. I have an extensive platform that will be available on our website that everyone can take a look at. It covers everything from mental health all the way down to um, Title IX services. I think it's pretty comprehensive. It took me quite a bit of time to put it together, and I've already started making some headway on it, so I'm really excited about it. And I'm also excited to be here. I'm excited to talk to you. I haven't seen you in a while. I know, right, man. I, uh, you know me. I, I'm a bit of a social butterfly. Yeah. And, uh, I enjoy being on campus. And actually, the last time I had any kind of event on campus was with you all with your general body meeting that time. Yeah. But, yeah. And we had a lot of fun that day. Times got conscrewed and misconstrued and <laughs> placed and everything, and we still had a great time. So it worked out. My last memories of UAB and <laughs> doing outreach was with you all. Uh, so you say you're like in that gray area between your second and third year of the PhD? My third program? and fourth year. Third yeah. and fourth year. Okay. Yeah. So what's the PhD experience been like for you? Um, it's been difficult. Um, so I. I don't know how things work in a lot of other disciplines, but <clears throat> in the sciences, you can go straight from your bachelor's degree into a PhD program, and you can totally skip over getting your master's. And so that's what I did. And from, I think it was a good, it was good because my program is funded. So I didn't have, I haven't had to pay any money out of pocket to get my degree thus far. And I don't anticipate having to do that as long as, you know, my boss is willing to foot the bill for me and I'm still able to get external funding. I won't have to pay for anything. And it also kind of pays me like a job. And so um, that was kind of one of the, one of the things that really drew me to a PhD program as opposed to going for my master's, but it's also been a super steep learning curve because usually you know, you take your master's and you'll start your thesis research and maybe do a master's thesis and then turn that into your dissertation when you do your PhD. Yeah. But when you skip from your bachelor's straight to your PhD, you kind of got to make up that lost time, so to speak. Um, so still taking classes, still, you know, trying to find a lab that's right for you, still mm -hmm. figuring out what your, your thesis project is going to be, taking a qualifying exam, all that good stuff, um, which right now I'm kind of ramping up toward taking my qualifying exam. So that's kind of the next big milestone I have to look ahead to. Okay, good. So uh, yeah, I've, you know, being in counseling, I've had my share of uh, uh, students in the PhD programs and uh, it's, a, <clears throat> it's a journey. 
uh, hearing yeah. you all talk about it. And I've heard some hard stories. I've heard some, you know, some great stories at the same time. And so what's it been like, you know, for the, the graduate student uh, navigating COVID and all the changes that's going on in college campuses? Yeah, so our, I know uh, we're kind of on our own kind of side of campus, all the biomedical and medical things. And so for us, it's been going into the lab when you're able to. So a lot of us, um, we actually were all, all the labs were kind of ramped down, not completely closed, but everything that was non-essential was closed. And then the things that were essential, like taking care of animal models or, you know, pieces of equipment that may need, you know, refilling with liquids or things like that, mm -hmm. that stuff still kept going, but the rest of the research really kind of hit a standstill. And so uh, quite a few students have gotten exemptions. So basically they're able to go in and do essential experiments and, you know, keep animal models happy and, and alive and everything. But other than that, it's been a lot of working from home. It's been a lot of Zoom calls, a lot of Zoom lab meetings, a lot of Zoom seminars, a lot of um, sending things back and forth via email as opposed to going to someone's office and physically handing them a document. Um, it's been a lot of writing and reading, uh, not doing a lot of the technical stuff with my hands that I really enjoy doing, but still kind of I guess broadening my foundation of knowledge by being able to read papers and you know write grant applications and things like that. So all of that sounds pretty exhausting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, that sounds pretty exhausting. Yeah, it, it definitely is. And um, like I was telling you before we started this meeting, I'm actually currently in a <clears throat> a week. Um, I'm really fortunate to have a primary investigator or a boss who is um, very understanding and understands that we're people and we have things that go on in the lab, but we also have lives outside of the lab. So I'm mm -hmm. currently in the middle of a week where I am doing nothing related to my research. Um, so I was going through a period of burnout. Yeah. I was doing a lot of things both in the lab and outside of the lab that just really contributed to me feeling like textbook burnout. Like I was feeling resentful about my work. I wasn't really feeling connected to my work. I was mm -hmm. feeling actually like feelings of hostility toward having to do my work. Mm -hmm. um, just not really wanting to do it, wanting to do anything other than that. And then that bled over into feeling hostility toward, you know, people I work with feeling hostility toward my personal friends, my professional friends, and so my boss and I finally got to a point where, you know, I came to him and I said, hey, I'm not in a good headspace right now. Yeah, There's yeah. You know, a lot of things going on outside of my life. You know, I have people close to me that are affected by COVID-19. My community in general is affected by COVID-19 disproportionately. I'm having to, you know, kind of reconcile with all of that while also meeting these expectations of being a graduate student and writing, reading, attending meetings, things like that. And so um, he just told me, you know, take a, take a week off. Don't do anything lab related. Don't come to lab meeting. Don't mm -hmm. do anything that, um, don't come into the lab. Don't do any of that stuff. Just be at home and yeah. figure out, you know, what you're, what you, what you need. And so that's, this is, that was Friday. And so this is now Monday. So I kind of took the weekend and really kind of decompressed. But one of the first things I did that I think was super important was I took a piece of paper and wrote a list of every single thing that I'm involved in. Yeah. So every organization, every project I consult on, things that I'm a part of online, executive boards I'm a part of. And I had over half this piece of paper that was full. And it immediately dawned on me that like I wasn't um, – I was fitting my science and my degree in between my extracurriculars and not the other way around. Yeah, and so I yeah. wasn't feeling, I wasn't feeling burnout from my research. I was feeling burnout from all the stuff I was doing on the side. Mm. So I spent the weekend sending out emails to a bunch of people and telling them like, Hey, I am again, mentally not in a great place. I need to put my degree first. So I need to drop yeah. this obligation. And I pared it down to like three things that I, 
really, really think are important. So GSG president is one of those things. And so now just doing that alone, I feel like a huge weight off my shoulders and like I'm able, I'll be better able to focus on my research. So when I, you know, when I hear that, uh, you know, I hear making very sound choices and decisions on increasing your overall well-being. Mm-hmm. You know, doing an assessment of everything that you have going on, and you know, you we commit to things. We you know we overcommit, and we look up and we have like a big balancing act going on, and we're juggling so many things, and it's like. And like you said, you end up finding resentment in some of the things that you're committed to. Mm. Uh, it's definitely on the way to like, you know, total burnout. And so to be able to pull back, you know, take some things off the table is extremely important. Now, let me ask you this. How difficult was it to send those emails out to these individuals and have to remove yourself from it? Oh, yeah, that's that was very difficult. So I actually ended up just literally copying and pasting an email, honestly, and sending it to all the different people I had to send one to. And I (laughs) set them all in the drafts box and just like went and watched TV and like nine o'clock at night, I was like, I got to send these emails. So I just opened it on my phone, sent them all, and then just deleted the mail app off my phone until Monday morning. So I was like, I do not want to see what these replies are going to look like. Yeah, um, yeah. I didn't anticipate anyone being upset with me or anything, but I just didn't want to, you know, deal with the fact that like I had to stop doing these things. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, yeah, sending those emails was probably the most difficult part. Yeah. And that's one of those things like, you, you know, we know we need to communicate those needs that we have for ourselves and but we, you know, we'll catastrophize those situations and we'll think mm-hmm. oh, if I do this and somehow it's going to all fall apart. And I have to be a part of it. Yeah. And then there are those people who will try to guilt you into thinking that, well, you know, maybe if you do this, you can still do it. Like they don't necessarily, you know, respect your time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's important that, you know, you respect your time and, you know, other people have to just get in line. And so, yeah. Uh, and, you know, creating one email, sending it out is perfect. You know, spending too much time trying to, you know, construct. 10 lovely worded emails with all this passion and stuff like that. Like, yeah, you know, it's not necessary. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so kudos to you for doing that. And, uh, and, and even like you said, like deleting the app off your phone. So you're not tempted to get a reply to feel the need to reply and soften mm-hmm. the blow and all that stuff. That's good stuff. Good, good. Yeah. So what is Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say I was going to plug in uh, student counseling services. So I actually do go and see y'all. I have a, a counselor that I see there. And they were actually the first person months back when I was having another, you know, bent toward burnout. They were the person that was like, hey, you, you're doing a lot. Like, it's great mm-hmm. that you're doing a lot, but you're also doing a lot. And you're not yeah. able to completely give yourself to the things that you're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, so kind of having to revisit that in the past couple of weeks since I've gotten to this more advanced stage of burnout has been super helpful. And it's, uh, it's been a big help, especially this past year that I've been going to counseling services. Yeah, well, good, good, good. And, you know, regardless of, you know, what we say is up to you all to do the work. And so yeah. you did the work. So you made the choice. And, uh, and having, doing that and then having this week off, it definitely sets you up you know, going forward, because like you said, things are ramping up towards your qualifying exam. So there you go. Uh, Now, I know you mentioned that, you know, your PI has been real good and everything. And you're the president of GSG now. I think you were involved with GSG prior to this. Yeah. I'm sure you filled a lot of information. Uh, So what are some things that, you know, students express that, they need at a time like this because as we've seen in some other uh, reports from students and other parts of campus that all the teachers aren't really, you know, being really accommodating at a time like this. (laughs) And so uh, I don't know, have you heard anything from the graduate perspective that you wouldn't mind sharing? And I don't want to put you or anybody in a position to where you feel like 
Yeah, no, it's, it's not a problem. Um, the graduate biomedical sciences program, our, um, the head of our program is Dr. David Schneider, who's also an associate or an assistant dean for the graduate school. And he's fantastic. So every week, every Wednesday morning, we have a Zoom call where him and other people from our staff office come and they field our questions, our concerns, our complaints about how things are going during this period of, you know, working from home. Mm-hmm. And so we had a call last Wednesday, and one of the things that um, that a student brought up was that there's just a lot of general anxiety. So a lot of yeah. faculty members, you know, they're experiencing pay cuts or, you know, job insecurity because maybe they don't have tenure yet. So everything is banking on them getting funding um, through grants. And so mm-hmm. that anxiety is kind of trickling down to students who are, yeah. you know, getting I don't want to say that their their expectations are higher, but they're kind of being a little more on to them about, hey, can you, you know, when we get back, can you do this experiment? While we're sitting at home, can you read these papers? Can you write this paper? Can you do this? And so I think that a lot of students have been just kind of feeling the effects of just general anxiety. I think everyone is anxious. We don't know when we're going back. We don't know how it's going to be when we go back. We don't know if we'll ever be in a a situation where we're we're able to have, you know, giant seminar halls full of people ever again. So it's just a lot of a lot of anxiety and a lot of being unsure about things that has really just trickled down to the students. Yeah. And uh you know that, that this definitely has to be tough, you know, and to be in a position like you're in, uh you know the as, as the president, almost being like a go-between sometimes between, like, between faculty and student. Mm. Like, what are some things that, you know, you all are doing as GSG to, you know, help with this, whether it be communication or services or whatnot? What are some things that you're doing? So one thing that we are doing is really trying to keep things running as close to normal as possible. Mm-hmm. So we have a Senate meeting on the first Wednesday of every month. And we're still doing that, even though it's via Zoom, but we're still keeping everything really kind of the same flow of operations. Mm -hmm. So we're, you know, still having a formalized meeting. We're asking students, you know, change your Zoom background to something fun or bring your pet, you know, something to lighten the mood and just kind of trying to keep things running as close to normal as we can. So that when, if we ever do get back to a place where we're able to go back and do things relatively normally that students don't feel like we're having to like tiptoe our way back into doing things. Yeah. Um, we've also, GSG has also contributed, I don't know the exact dollar amount, but we've contributed over $10,000 to the COVID-19 fund. Mm-hmm. And this has been, um, Sahila was our last treasurer and she really did a lot of like mental mathematic gymnastics to get money from mm-hmm. our budget to donate to this fund. And a lot of our student groups gave up most, if not all of their funding to, to donate to the fund. So we've kind of shifted our gears more away from serving the students by doing things in person to serving the students mm-hmm. by giving our resources to um, a fund where students are able to use it. Okay, good stuff, good, good, good. And so, <clears throat> so with that, is going on on the campus side. Mm. What about you personally? How do you cope? How do you manage all this, you know, being at home and social distancing and all this, you know, everything? How are you managing it all? Yeah, um, I, I'm actually an introvert naturally, so I'm not having an awful time being at home. Um, <laughs> I kind of, I generally am the person that's like, yeah, we'll go out Friday. And then, you know, an hour before I'm like, actually, I, uh, You're one of those memes I fell asleep. Plans. <laughs> exactly. Like, <laughs> I just don't, I don't have a formalized excuse to flake on my friends anymore. But, um, <laughs> I, I've been, I guess the hardest part has been like, home being everything. So home is my gym, home is my office, home is my restaurant, home is, you know, where I sleep at, it's everything. And so having to kind of really draw hard lines between what happens where. So, Mm -hmm. you know, taking naps and going to bed only in my bedroom, as opposed to also on my couch, because on my couch is also where I watch TV. 
and then doing work only at my desk because if I do it on my couch, that's also where I watch TV. So I'm going to start watching TV. Um, Just kind of having to draw hard lines between what happens where, but also just establishing a daily routine has been really, really helpful. Yeah. That's one of the things I noticed for me when this first started was uh, that first week being at home, it was just chaotic, you know, um, reading, when I was reading too many Facebook posts and yeah. uh, <laughs> seeing too many breaking news articles. I am like, I'm going to tell you, that first week, I thought by now we would be in like the Hunger Games. <laughs> <laughs> the way it was coming out, I was like, Lord, oh. I am legend. <laughs> <laughs> In a matter of weeks, and so, uh, and so you know, you know me, I'm a workout warrior, and I mean, like that first week, I see. how'd you work out? And so, you know, finding that structure was important. Um, mm-hmm. You know, for me, working out and getting up early and going versus like rolling out of bed in time for that versus Zoom meeting, <laughs> and uh, and then once we started doing, you know, the counseling from home, and you know, even though it's not an office, we're still doing the work itself. So that kind of increase the level of normalcy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, you know, trying to find that routine. And we, you know, we've come from a situation where like the structure was sort of just given to us. Now we're trying to like implement the structure. You pointed out some good things of like the couch is a couch, the bed is the bed, the, the desk is the desk and like, you know, keeping things separate as much as possible. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, with the exercise and everything, like finding ways to do that and uh, it's all very important and uh, very important to keep that normalcy in as much as possible. Uh, and one thing we talk about a lot is like, you know, just staying in the present, you know, control the controllable, stay where you are. All these things exist, like what's going to happen in the fall, how are things, I mean, that, that stuff is important. Mm-hmm. And then it's all about, okay, what can I do about it right now in this moment? And so bringing it back to right now and like, you know, focus on what we can is, uh, is challenging. And it's something we have to work at, but it's definitely worth the work, you know. So yeah. Uh, so what are your career goals? You know, you explain your 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 study as a scientist, and you know, ninety percent of it did like this with me until you said diabetes and insulin. <laughs> so, yeah, we know that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what's the what's the uh, long term goals? Um, long term goal is actually to go into policy. So mm-hmm. I am still on the fence about whether or not I actually want to run for office at any point, but really just helping with being kind of like a policy analyst, someone who actually knows the science behind how different policies may be enacted, how different policies will actually affect scientists, um, something that I think is sorely lacking in today's political climate. Okay. Well, we can, you know, come back to this as like maybe some like springboard or platform or when they your Netflix documentary they can refer (laughs) back to this podcast. (laughs) Good deal. Well uh well like we do with each one each one of these we have a little fun towards the end. Mm -hmm. And uh in the game I love called One Gotta Go. So I'm gonna share my screen and uh we're gonna talk about it. So One got to go. <laughs> oh, this is man. The fiasco here. So we got ribs, steak, shrimp, and fried chicken. So the way it goes is that you're going to pick your first one to stay. And, uh, and you, you'll give your reason as to why you're choosing that as the one to stay. And then I'll go, and then you'll go to we'll get to the point where we're kicking one off the screen. All right. Uh, ooh, this one, why is this so difficult? I know, right? I think I've had like each of these over the past few weeks from grilling. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I've been watching your Instagram stories like ribs are, ribs are pretty good. Yeah, um, I've got, gotten pretty good at those. My brother really uh, helps me out with the, uh, my grill coach. <laughs> so what's the, uh, first which, one to, what's the first one to stay? First one to stay is going to be fried chicken. All right, why fried chicken? Just who I fried chicken just has a very special place in my heart. Like even being a child, mm-hmm. I used to just 
eat chicken bones, not like actually eat the bone, but you know, like eat the meat off the bone instead of having a yeah. pacifier. So fried chicken is just very near and dear to my heart. I was a very country child, clearly growing up. Yeah, what you um, know about that? You get the meat off the, uh, <laughs> the drumstick and then get that baby the bone. It was something that yep, yeah. that's it. That'll keep you busy for at least an hour. So I'm going to go with fried chicken just because the texture, <laughs> the crunch, Right. The juicy chicken inside, undefeated. Fried chicken has to stay. All right, dark meat or white meat? Ooh, I'm going to counter your question by asking you, drums or flats? Drums. Fried hard drums. You're entitled to your own opinion. <laughs> I'm going to go, if it's fried chicken, I'm going to go with white meat. Okay. Got you. Yeah, I, I'm dark meat is trash. I can't do dark meat. Ooh, I think it depends on the recipe. If you're frying chicken, though, dark meat is not it. But white meat fried chicken, delicious. But also flats for life. So, nah. You know, luckily my wife likes flats. So whenever we get wings, it just hopefully there's an even number of flats and uh, drums. Why's one of y'all gonna be hungry? <laughs> Somebody gonna be shocked if I ain't giving up my drums. So that's <laughs> work. Uh, yeah, dark meat. Nah, it's too veiny. What I'm biting. That's true. All right, so first one to stay for me. Uh, I'm gonna go fried chicken as well. Like, yeah, I'm gonna go with fried chicken as well. A uh, fun fact about me, when I was in college, I was the weekend student manager in the Sodexo dining hall on campus. Oh. So every Sunday uh, for dinner, I used to like be a really trash dinner. And so when I became the student manager, we like, you know, we like, yo, we got to make this thing good because you got people coming here to eat and it's just like nothing. And so we started fried chicken Sundays. So I would make the fried chicken. And, uh, Oh, a lot of experimentation till it got pretty good, and then it got really good. And so that was a thing for a couple of years on campus was fried chicken Sundays in the calf. But I love some fried chicken. The skin has got to be super crunchy. Yes, no soggy skin. So I don't do church's chicken or nothing like that. I need my skin crunchy. Well, I would want to eat the skin off the chicken, and uh, and only chicken breast. Like I don't, you know, but I'm very picky when it comes to like chicken. But fried chicken, I can I can keep fried chicken. My, if my aunt cooks it, it's it's a home run every time. All right, what's next for you? Uh, next one to stay for me is gonna be ribs. Yeah. Just because, as I grew up eating fried chicken, my stepdad. If you mention the word ribs around him, he's going to pull a rack out of the freezer, and now we're having ribs. Um, <laughs> my dad, he used to actually want to own, like, a barbecue rig. So for yeah. a while, like, we were literally eating ribs, like, multiple times a week. Like, he was making his own barbecue sauce. He was trying different kinds of rubs. Yeah. Like, I was, I just had, like, a three-month period where I just had pork sweats, like, every single day because we were eating so <laughs> many ribs. But... I just love, like, as long as they're cooked appropriately, where they just yeah. fall off the bone and you don't got to, yeah. you know, like, tug away from the bone. Yeah, you got to, like, it. gnaw it like this, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, if you got to, like, strain that neck to get it off of there, you can just leave <laughs> that on the plate. But if yeah. I pick that bone up and the bone comes out and the rib is still on the plate, like, yeah, I'll be in the corner the with my plate. <laughs> y'all yeah. do what y'all got to do. You in the game, that's for certain. All right, <laughs> next for me to stay. Whew. I'm going to go with steak. And that's a recent thing for me because for the longest, I wasn't a big steak eater. I'm not a huge meat eater in general. Mm -hmm. sort of like the amount of meat I consume, you know, I eat it about once a day. But steak has, when I learned how to eat steak, when I was younger, first off, we never had steak that much. If you got it, I mean, it was well done, beyond well done. <laughs> you need it. Heinz 57 or A1 steak sauce to get it down your throat at times. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, growing up, my experiences with steak weren't like the best. But now that I've gotten older, 
and I've had like really good steaks and like know the you know rare versus medium rare versus medium well and stuff like that. Like I know how to get it. Like growing up, it was either rare or well done. Like I ain't see it in between. Like I used to work with a guy. He would just say, "Take oh. the steak, run it across the grill a couple of times, and then give it oh. to me." <laughs> I was like, yeah, I'm taking well done. <laughs> and so now, like, and I cook I cook a decent steak. And, like, you know, if you cook it right, you don't even need any steak sauce. So I, you know, I'm feeling some steak right about now. I don't eat it too often. When I do, you know, I like to – I grill it myself. When I won't necessarily go a place to get it. Mm. But, yeah. You get so the steak. grill marks on your steak like this picture? Either that or why lately I've been like searing it in a cast iron skillet and then putting it on the grill to finish it. I like this. Yeah, you get a lot of flavor in that uh that seasoning like that. So I've enjoyed that. All right. Uh what's next for you? Uh next to steak for me, I'm also go with steak. So shrimp is gonna be my one that has to go. Right. Um steak. Just like my dad made ribs, my dad made steak. Like, I grew up eating steak because my dad mm -hmm. really spoiled me from day one. Um, but we, I remember the first time I had like a steak where I was like, I may never be able to be a vegan, was like, we went to Ruth Chris Steakhouse and they bring out your steak to you on a 500 degree plate. So mm -hmm. I asked for my steak medium well and they bought my steak out and it was like, medium rare and I you know I cut it and I'm like this ain't what I asked for and they were like well you're supposed to put it on your plate like cut it and then put that piece on your plate to cook it the rest of the way and I did oh. that and ate it and I was like okay so this That's is how you're that. supposed to eat a steak <laughs> um, <laughs> this is what I will be eating for the rest of my life man um, so, have you yeah, tried to me, do that yourself Get your plate Absolutely real high not. And take the steak on it. No, I am. I could just see that going eighteen different <laughs> ways to end up with me being in the hospital, and my mom is not going to take us to the hospital Monday through Sunday. So, I really just had Monday to uh, exactly. Not a home remedy. But yeah. <laughs> also, I make steak at home. Um, I put it, like you said, in a cast iron, but I put it in my oven actually. It doesn't get too. the grill marks, but it's also still really, really good. You get a nice crust on it. So yeah. I, I'm going to have to keep steak and send, send the shrimp packing. All right. So is it, was it, are you, are you a fan of shrimp or is it just kind of like, you know, between the two? It's hard to, you know, you can't pick shrimp. So I have a whole thing about shrimp, okay? Let me start by saying I love shrimp. Like shrimp, fantastic. Shrimp Alfredo, shrimp scampi. I'm going to go on a whole Forrest Gump like Bubba Gump shrimp thing, all that shrimp that he mentioned, I will eat it. Yeah. But two things about shrimp. One, if you overcook it, it's like chewing on a rubber band. Yes. And it takes you less than 30 seconds to overcook some shrimp. So once you overcook it, you got to just throw it in the trash, but no one ever throws it in the trash. They want to try to give it to you anyway. Oh, yeah. So that's my it's first thing about shrimp. That's money. Exactly. Second thing about shrimp is when they you go to a restaurant and they put shrimp in your meal and they don't take the tails off. What am I supposed to do? Like, yeah, it's a meal where everything mixes together and you got a shrimp with a tail on it. It's like exactly, I and I'm to take my tail off now. I gotta either a cut the tails off in which place in which place I'm leaving some of the meat in the tail, yeah. or. I got to use my hands and now I look uncivilized at this five-star restaurant. So those are my <laughs> options. You got the thing. <laughs> but also I've learned recently that some people just eat the tails of the shrimp. How sweet. And yeah, I, I want no beef with any of those people because I know they have nothing to lose if that's how they're going. But <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to just have to, I'm going to let shrimp rock by itself. I'm going to keep okay. everything else. Gotcha. Ooh, this is a tough one for me. Uh, ribs, man, that, that you know, that's connected to some childhood memories. <laughs> like you, like, like my, grand, my grandfather's side of the family. I lived in the house with my grandparents and my mom. So my grandfather's side of the family, every 4th of July, like, 
his side of the family had a family reunion, our investment man, and boy, we would, it would just be ribs on top of ribs on top of ribs. <laughs> I mean, it's the same way to this day. And so, uh, yeah, we didn't get it often throughout the year, but man, you can guarantee the ribs would come in. My grandmother had like this barbecue sauce she made, which always consisted of me going to the store to get one Budweiser for her. <laughs> one? Never, yeah, never kept drinks in the house. <laughs> and so we would get like one Budweiser and uh, she eat that one can of Budweiser <laughs> to make her uh, barbecue sauce. Then it was like, I'm gonna grab two cans and bring one home. <laughs> <laughs> but uh but yeah i mean her barbecue sauce was so good we would pour it on top of potato chips and barbecue bread and just eat it like oh wow okay so yeah the ribs were connected to something special and like and in the beginning like i'm not a huge spare rib person at all but like baby backs and st louis cuts once i discovered that part of it i was like okay mm -hmm. this is my spot you know i'm good with ribs like this I don't eat them a lot, but when I do, man, they're connected to something. Shrimp, I love shrimp. But man, it's so hit and miss. Yes. You know, like my father and my stepmother lived in Mobile, so getting like there, getting shrimp is like, yo, this is real seafood. You can taste the difference. Mm. Versus like, I go to Walmart and get a bag of frozen shrimp. And it's like, you got a small window of life of cooking it. <laughs> 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 well, it's not that good you thought that the same day you finna cook it. Don't leave it yeah. in the fridge any extra time. You're playing with that, man. You got to cook that then with a timer, you know. So <laughs> definitely. <laughs> so yeah, I guess shrimp is off the board for the both of us. But I still like Agreed. shrimp. Agreed. Still like shrimp. I do. I still like shrimp. You know, you put a plate of shrimp in front of me. I'm gonna at least eat a couple of them. But like I said, if it's chewing on a rubber band, I'm gonna just push that plate on over to you. Yeah. And each of these things, man, they got more connection to like, it means something to me more than shrimp. Shrimp was like, oh, shrimp is yeah. But growing up, we didn't have shrimp. It was like, I got out of my own a little bit and tasted shrimp. <laughs> I didn't make it to the dinner table in the Williams house. <laughs> <so. laughs> yep, yeah. Cool, cool. Well, definitely, that was fun. I love doing One Gotta Go. It gives like insight into who we are. Now, you say you're from the country. Like, where are you from? So I was born and raised, or early life raised, in Columbus, Georgia. My parents okay. were in the military, though, so we moved around really? a lot. And so now my parents live right outside of Augusta. But all my mom's side of the family that I grew up with is still in Columbus, Eufaula, Opelika, Phoenix City. Yeah. Like, Man, we might know some of the same people. Yeah, my, uh, we my really might be related. Every day I find a new relative, for real, so... <laughs> Yeah, my uncle, uh, he retired to Columbus, golly, 30 some years ago, maybe. And uh, yeah, he's been there. And so, uh, yeah, in Columbus, Georgia. And retired to that military base and just stayed there. So, yep, that's where I was born, Fort Benning. Yep, Fort Benning. Good deal. Well, you've been a great guest. I'm glad we had you on. You know, when Thank I started you for having started me. this whole thing, it was like when we started this, it was like I already had like people in mind. <clears throat> you were one of those ones floating around. And uh so I appreciate you doing this for me. And uh I know people got something from this because getting the student perspective is so important. We had one of the undergrad students come and talk and not have had the graduate to have the graduate student perspective. It's uh you know, the people need to see it. The higher ups need to see it. Other students need to see it. And so uh, tune in. This drops tomorrow, Tuesday at 430. And uh, we'll make sure to tag GSG in it. And y'all can share it as well. Of course. So that's another episode. Like I said before, student counseling is open. UAB, GSG, Instagram, follow them and see what they're doing virtually as well. Uh, and y'all stay safe out there. Have a good day.